you've probably seen some videos from Kurzgesagt, and now you might be wondering, oh, come on, really? You're going to be debunking their videos? Can't you go bother some denialists or something? Or what, are you actually pro-doomerism? Well, while dunking on denialists is fun, the question is, why? One might say that quantity matters, and that it's good that a person looking for videos on climate crisis finds more of those which accept it than those which deny it. But that misses one important point. The political fight for the existence of climate change is already won. We did it, everyone! We won! We got this! Yeah! However, what we're seeing now is that the climate crisis is no longer the point of the battle. It's becoming the battlefield where the fight is actually going on. And this is entering the mainstream, considering the two recent climate videos from Kurzgesagt, one of the leading edutainment channels which creates pop sci videos based only on science, where facts are clearly distinct from opinions, but not from ideology, as we'll see today. We'll do it by looking at two videos in reverse chronological order. First one saying that hope is not lost, and we agree, and the second is that we can't do much as individuals. And here we also agree. So, hold on, if you agree, then why make this video? Well, a tiny introduction. We actually run a Polish channel, and this is our first translated video. More on that in the end. And we're doing social issues from a philosophical perspective. So, you might ask, what does philosophy have to do with climate crisis? Turns out, quite a lot, even though it's a topic that's been coming to focus for the last 15 years or so. But for the purpose of this video, what's important is that philosophy allows us to see that things which seem natural and obvious are actually propped up by a ton of hidden assumptions. By looking at them, we hope to show you how the fight for the climate is changing and, hopefully, to make you aware of some tricks that are being used. That said, we're big fans of democracy and multiplicity of voices. So this video isn't meant to destroy Kurzgesagt with facts and logic, but instead of that, offer dive into a parallel vision, so that you may choose in a more conscious way. And during our dive, we'll talk about what rationality is, and how numbers can hypnotize it, and about an old-timey way of looking at the future, and a futuristic way of looking at the past. So, let's go! Oh, but first one more thing. Just like Kurzgesagt, we believe that an emission-free world without any humanitarian crisis is possible and that climate justice is important, desired, and possible. We just completely disagree on the way of getting there. Our home is burning. Rapid climate change is destabilizing our world. It seems our emissions will not fall quickly enough to avoid runaway warming, and we may soon hit tipping points that will lead to the collapse of ecosystems and our civilization. While scientists, activists, and much of the younger generation urge action, it appears most politicians are not committed to doing anything meaningful, while the fossil fuel industry still works actively against change. It seems humanity can't overcome its greed and obsession with short-term profit and personal gain to save itself. And so for many, the future looks grim and hopeless. Young people feel particularly anxious and depressed, Instead of looking ahead to a lifetime of opportunity, they wonder if they will even have a future or if they should bring kids into this world. It's an age of doom and hopelessness, and giving up seems the only sensible thing to do. But that's not true. You are not doomed. Humanity is not doomed. We've left the whole introduction for the sake of fairness. We agree 100% that climate doomerism ultimately only benefits the fossil fuel industry. We also agree that there are grounds for optimism, but we place ours in something completely different. Starting now, we'll omit some bits that we don't have a particular problem with. That means we'll skip a lot of good and important stuff. Because the video is progressive in many regards, like the thing we just talked about. Yet the word progress is not as obvious as it may seem. But that comes later. First, let's backtrack a bit. It seems humanity can't overcome its greed and obsession with short-term profit and personal gain to save itself. Okay, this is a necessary simplification for such a short video. But if we want to dig a bit deeper, we must first deal with the term humanity. Although humanity is a single species, it is also amazingly diverse. Let's recall what we said about the so-called Anthropocene, or the human epoch. 
Oh, and since the following bit is from our previous video, which we haven't translated at the time of filming, we'll only translate the voiceover and important text and leave the visual gags or Polish references. Who is this Anthropos? If we had, say, Bajerocene, when badgers would be the main geological force, that wouldn't be much of a problem, because all badgers have a similar way of life. But Anthropocene isn't really an effect of actions done by some mass of people, but actions of a particular group with a particular approach coming from a particular continent. It made a lot of money for the Global North, which exploited the Global South, or at least that's the simplest way of dividing it. Are we sure that both of these groups should be labeled as a single humanity? Or we can look at it from a different angle. Every country has elites, which live way better than average citizens, and consume adequately more. And the poor, who live way worse. Would it be fair to say that both sides are equally as guilty and that everyone should just reduce their consumption? Now, to be fair, both of the videos we discussed today do talk about the difference between rich and poor countries. Kurzgesagt even did a separate video on the topic, and it's mostly correct. But since they've spent a relatively long time on these topics, it's easier to see what is not there. For example, though they accept the different scale of responsibility for rich and poor countries, they say nothing about the reasons why poor countries are poor. At best, we can assume that they didn't use as much fossil fuels or something? The big reason is, of course, colonialism. Oh, sure, Europeans did bring modern technology or governance to the colonies, but these were only used to create a peripheral semi-states, the only role of which was to serve the imperial core with no regard to local populace, culture or nature. And when these states finally managed to achieve independence, which for most African countries only took place in the 50s and 60s, they ended up as countries with an economy based almost exclusively on plantations and resource extraction and transport infrastructure that led from production centers to ports. They had barely any internal transport, trade or education. In order to survive, these countries had to continue exporting cheap raw materials and purchase manufactured goods from the imperial core, which were anything but cheap and keep hoping that, somehow, they'll be able to afford some degree of wealth and comfort. Let's keep that in mind for later. It's really difficult to speak of humanity as a single actor without first acknowledging this internal conflict. The statement on human greed and obsession with a short-term gains is similarly slippery. Even though that's the only thing we'll hear about the possible, say, philosophical causes of the climate crisis, and that's another reason for why the simplification of one humanity is so unfair. There are way more people in the world who aren't greedy or looking for short-term profit. Because, say, they are parents, for example, and just want the best for the future of their children. Or they are members of a local community who mostly just want to maintain the tradition and landmarks of their town. There are even whole cultures who only care about living life their own way. These people are empathically not the ones responsible for the climate crisis, even though the video would like to paint the humanity as some greed-obsessed corporate boss from the 90s. And even that brings to mind cartoon villains who are evil because they are stupid, weak or envious. All internal reasons. But wouldn't it be more useful to look at greed as something that's simply a result of our economic system, where corporations need to report ever-increasing profits in each following quarter, no matter how high they were before? First, it doesn't essentialize greed by saying, well, that's just how humanity is. And second, it shows the reality of who, or rather, what, is responsible for the climate crisis. Dang, we started a bit hard, haven't we? Well, if it looks like we're nitpicking, then, like, don't worry, we are getting somewhere with this. Anyway, next we have a description of what 2 and 3 degrees of warming might look like. We'll focus only on a single point which is relevant to us. Large-scale natural systems will break down. The scale and frequency of hurricanes, fires and droughts will further increase and cause trillions in damage. Poor regions and subsistence farmers will be hit the hardest. Hundreds of millions of people will need to leave their homes. We're talking about the 3 degree warming scenario. If we look in the sources, we'll find a Red Cross article from 2019 stating that by 2050, the number of people needing humanitarian aid could double to 200 million. 
There are newer reports though, like the Groundswell report by the World Bank updated in 2021, which estimates that in a similar time frame there will be up to 216 million internal climate migrants in six regions of the world. So, not counting the global north, mostly. And let's keep in mind that this is just the three upcoming decades, when the temperature will only be reaching 2 degree rise. Then we'll have a half a century of actually living in a world approaching the plus 3 degrees. So the hundreds of millions does seem a bit conservative. Although substantial risk still remains, we can pretty confidently say that humanity isn't going anywhere. Civilization might have to change, but it will endure. We can see in the source document that what Kurzgesagt means by apocalypse is a total, or near total, extinction of mankind, and that even if we avoid this apocalypse, we could still be facing some grim scenarios. This visualization though seems to oversimplify the whole thing, because it shows that humanity, again as a whole, will adapt and survive. In reality, if we ever needed such an extreme adaptation, it would probably mean billions of victims. And let's face it, who can actually afford this kind of adaptation? Not the Global South, that's for sure. Which begs the question, what has changed over the last 10 years? And is this really good news? The Invisible Shift. You probably know this story. The last decade has been an immense failure for climate policies around the world. In 2010, many people expected these trends to continue. Instead of decreasing fossil fuel use, its consumption would rise. The next decade turned out to be very different, though. First of all, coal burning in developing countries like India has slowed down or leveled off, like in China. And it's plummeted in rich countries like the UK and US. Since 2015, three quarters of planned coal plants have been cancelled and 44 countries have committed to stop building them. Ten years ago, that would have seemed like wishful thinking. But today, we can say with confidence, coal is dying. It's just not competitive anymore. Yep, that's true. Coal usage in these countries is going down. But in many cases, it's being replaced by natural gas. All in all, gas is a tricky subject. While it does emit less CO2 than coal, its extraction and transportation causes leakages, which tend to be notoriously underreported. And since methane is much stronger greenhouse gas than CO2, it might just turn out that the switch to gas was just a form of cooking the books. And ourselves. For example, the International Energy Association has measured that global methane emissions caused by excavation of gas and oil in 2020 added up to an equivalent of emissions of the whole EU energy sector. What we're trying to say here is that, sure, it's nice to look at the past and see progress, but we also need to critically look at the present. And Kurzgesagt doesn't really do that. We'll see why in a bit. Yeah, we know that we're sort of leading you on like this, but for now we are still getting all the pieces of the puzzle together. And we need the ending of the second Kurzgesagt video to get the last one. Because technologies we thought would remain expensive matured rapidly instead. Renewable electricity has shown explosive progress. One of the biggest obstacles is the variability of their power output. Renewables need a lot of energy storage to be a reliable power source, like expensive batteries. Amazingly, battery prices have decreased by 97% in the past 30 years, 60% in the last decade alone, which will serve all kinds of green technology like electric cars. While this graph may look promising, it's not something that should appear in an honest discussion about the climate crisis. This is basically just a step up from a PragerU video. The thing is that whatever we're seeing here is in no way connected to the physical world. Because in the physical world, things tend to be made out of stuff. And the thing we're talking about here is, as the name implies, made out of lithium. And boy, is lithium extraction not cool for the local ecosystems. Let's look at some facts. In 2020, the non-lithium deposits were 80 billion tons. 75% out of which were located in so-called lithium triangle between Argentina, Bolivia and Chile. The extraction process requires 2,000 tons of water per a ton of lithium. And since the deposits are often located under salt flats, its extraction contributes to additional drying of the already arid local areas, ruining ecosystems and forcing farmers to migrate. The evaporation pools, where the lithium dries out over months, can leak toxic waste into rivers, decimating their ecosystems. 
To put it in other words, there's a price for this price reduction, even though it may seem invisible to us, at least for now. Okay, but someone might say, Oh, you progress-fearing Luddites, have you not heard of the great horse manure crisis of 1894? We sure have, and we'll even talk about it. The joke named the Great Horse Manure Crisis of 1894 comes from an article by a libertarian historian Stephen Davies in which he describes the panic surrounding problems with New York and London transportation in the late 19th century. In particular, the problem was all of the horses used for carriages and horse buses. They, as we all once in a while, needed to go to the toilet. And so they just went there, on the street. Almost like Amazon drivers. <laughs> For instance, in New York, the horse um, emissions amounted to 1,000 tons of manure per day, and an often quoted, but fake, London Times article stated that in 50 years every street in London would be buried under 9 feet of manure. Well, this didn't happen, and the reason was simple. Horse transport was replaced by motorized transport, which didn't produce any manure, nor had any other catastrophic side effects. Anyway, where were we? Oh, right, the climate crisis. Davies points out a glaring flaw in the common sense thinking, the belief that the current trends will continue unchanged. This is the assumption behind all of the business-as-usual climate scenarios, where we don't alter our emissions, and behind way that the biggest climate doomers think. It's also complete horse emissions. Humanity has survived this long precisely because it is able to react to changes and the climate crisis will not be the first thing in history to change that. Sadly, the way we react can be better or worse. The author is a renowned activist in a libertarian and right-wing think tanks, so his solution to every crisis is to let the human genius roam free, especially free from those pesky taxes and regulations and government intervention. Doesn't mention the age of consent, though. As an example, he cites the great catastrophe of his times that had been looming large over the 2004 world. Oil, that is, the fact that oil was getting expensive, and that it will lead to the downfall of Western civilization. Well, it's true that the only time the price of oil went down to 2004 levels was in 2020, and yet our civilization did not fall, nor that our burning of oil had any other catastrophic side effects. Anyway, where were we? Oh, right! the climate crisis. So, coming back to our video, isn't it justified to have a healthy dose of techno-optimism? Sure, resource extraction may incur some environmental costs, but won't we be able to deal with these costs using new innovations? Well, two things can both be true. On the one hand, innovations do help us, but on the other, it's naive to see them as our only recipe for the future. Especially if we assume that it will be all fine forever and the innovation won't have any other catastrophic side effects. By the way, the data shown in the source document end up in 2019. That's not a conspiracy, just a limitation of the source, which is our world in data. A website that rose to prominence thanks to all the reports regarding the pandemic. Let's keep the name in the back of our collective heads, we'll talk about it again. Anyway, the problem with our current trends is that they have to be, well, Current. The 2020 pandemic and the recent war and sanctions have rocked the internal markets, including the lithium price as well as battery prices. Of course, this could either be temporary disturbance or a more general problem of demand outpacing supply. However, this is the second time that Kurzgesagt uses carefully chosen data because information on the stagnation and rise of consumer-grade electric car batteries was available a few months before this video was published. You might say, well, that's great, but didn't Kurzgesagt's last climate video say that while wind and solar are nice, we need nothing less than a fundamental transition of our global industrial system? Yes, but luckily the shift goes beyond just the energy sector. Throughout the economy, people are working on improving current technology to lower emissions. We're rapidly replacing old incandescent light bulbs with LEDs that are 10 times more efficient. So we've got a declaration about us changing the global industrial system. The industrial bit is a very precise choice of words, as we'll see in a moment. And a first example of innovation, LED light bulbs, which is cool, I guess, but not really a climate game changer. So let's move on to something that can be one, electric cars. In 2020, about seven out of 10 new cars in Norway were electric or hybrid, 
In 2021, it was already 8 out of 10. This is true, the data is correct. And Kurzgesagt doesn't hide in the source documents that Norway is an outlier in electric car adoption. It also helps that almost all of Norway's energy is renewable, meaning that the only emissions we had to consider are the ones released during manufacturing. But that's highly dependent on the country. If there's a lot of coal power, the CO2 emissions will be just slightly below gas cars, and the main advantage will be less smog and pollution in cities. But if we focus on clean countries, like hydroelectric Norway or nuclear France, the emissions go down by two-thirds, and that is considering that we fully exploit the battery life by driving 150,000 kilometers. But it gets worse, because there's an elephant in the room. Why can Norwegians afford these new cars? Let's take a look at their exports. Oh, right. Norway is one of the biggest exports of natural gas and oil, and the government presses to reduce emissions inside the country is an attempt at balancing that, which is great for Norway as a country, but really bad for Norway as an example, because they literally pay for these cars with more emissions. But okay, let's say that we've switched all of our passenger cars for electric ones, powered only by 100% clean energy, and cut our global emissions by 3.5%. That looks like a step in the right direction. But is it, or have we just fallen into a numbers trap? Well, first off, does this look any better now? The problem with electric cars, you see, is that they are an apparent solution to a very real problem, that our cities and villages are built not for people, but for cars, that instead of quiet, shaded pedestrian streets with wide pavements where we can stroll, we are forced to meet in cafes to avoid the traffic noise, that instead of having shops, a school, a clinic. In a walkable distance, we need to sit in traffic jams every day to get to the city center because our sparkling new subdivision was built without any infrastructural planning. Or finally, that instead of taking fast and affordable city transit, we need to accelerate and decelerate a one and a half ton metal box just to carry us and a few kilos of groceries. All of that is simply wasting energy. And at this point, it doesn't matter whether it comes from our renewable resources. All of these problems are so tiring and expensive for us because we need to save up for a new comfortable car, just to make these daily traffic jams somewhat bearable. This goes double for villages, where you can't properly function without a car. Sure, depending on the population density of the country, cars might be an only option, but in, say, European conditions, Cutting railway or bus connections, as has been taking place in the last 40 years, is downright criminal. And this key aspect of climate crisis is something that the videos consistently avoid. A huge part of our growth and so-called wealth is not only wasteful, but actively harmful to us. We use a great part of our wealth to deal with the problems created by our wealth. And the price is paid not only by the Earth system, but also by us. We pay with our time, we pay with our happiness, and we pay with our health. And this phenomena actually has a name, the irrationality of rationality. So let's discuss it. Our society values rationality, greatly, even to the extent that the word rational, in many contexts, is synonymous with good. This is a huge topic in philosophy, and we don't have time to even scratch the surface. So let's just cut out a slice and bite into it. The big daddy, or rather the big granddaddy of this slice, is Max Weber, the German sociologist and his 1905 cult classic The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. There he describes a type of rationality which is expressed as rationalization, calculability, standardization, set procedures, and the machinery of changing all of that. At the time of Weber, this rationality seemed to appear everywhere and to improve everything it touched. However, Weber saw a looming problem. Since it's easier to follow procedures than to change them, it's quite possible that we may end up in a Kafkaesque world of Byzantine rules and regulations, which will ultimately serve just to maintain themselves. He called this situation the iron cage of rationality. The idea has been expanded upon by an American sociologist called George Ritzer, who in 1993 wrote The Macdonaldization of Society. The book describes a process in which the whole world starts to follow the rules of the most rationalized branch of industry of all, the fast food industry. The McDonaldization is based on four principles – efficiency, calculability, predictability, and control. 
when we enter a McDonald's anywhere in the world, we know we're going to get mostly the same things as in every other McDonald's, in a similar time, because of standardized ingredients, standardized processes and standardized products. So far, so good. However, there's also a fifth principle to McDonaldization, and that's the irrationality of rationality. What this means is that even though the initial rationalization will be a change for the better for most people involved, like offering a faster and predictable service or a better division of labor, pretty soon we're going to be seeing some downsides, like the fact that McDonaldized food is really unhealthy or that its production is environmentally destructive or that the place is very dehumanizing, not only for the workers, but for the customers too. This rule applies to everything that is McDonaldized, education, transportation, or entertainment. Why can't McDonaldization find better balance than to avoid this rationality? To understand that, we actually need to go back a little bit to the big daddy of our slice. We're talking the 40s, and the two books, The Dialectic of Enlightenment and The Eclipse of Reason by two authors and famous Western society destroyers from the Frankfurt School, Theodor Adorno, and Max Horkheimer. Actually, Adorno co-authored only the first one, but there's something fitting about this line of thought having two dads. Anyways, according to them, the big idea of the Enlightenment was that it will free us from our old superstition and usher in a new era of science and reason. And not any old store-bought reason, but the pure gourmet raison. And it is this raison which will allow us to understand the universal rules not only of humanity, but also the universal rules of, well, the universe. However, Adorno and Horkheimer say that it didn't really work out and the Enlightenment has fallen into its own trap. Initially, it was supposed to free humanity from the rule of nature and desires and superstitions, so in a titanic act of self-reflection it came up with a right vision of raison and science to do the job. After all, the more humanity masters nature, the more free it gets, right? Right? Well, not really. Paradoxically, the problem is that these ideas they came up with were so effective that people spent all their free time just using them and didn't bother to improve or rethink them. They became a new dogma, but in a very insidious way. The natural sciences, believing that they are distinct from value judgments, were unable to see how they are being nurtured and entangled by bureaucracy and capitalism because it didn't lie in their field of focus. In the same process, bureaucracy and capitalism also became more scientific by pretending that they are merely an extension of the only rational way to govern the physical world. And thus, the reason of scientists has been degraded into just another instrument in the lab. I mean, sure, the stated goal was to understand nature and master it, but the real one was just to increase efficiency and profits. And since these goals were so intertwined, people stopped asking why and instead asked how. This marked the domination of what the authors called the instrumental reason, one that is focused on achieving the goal, not once wondering what is its value, and even being proud of this approach. This way of thinking has been summarized perfectly in 1989 by Polish sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, who, in his amazing book Modernity and the Holocaust, puts out probably most damning argument against modernity, that the Holocaust wasn't the work of some barbarians, but it was the result of applying instrumental reason, that it was the most horrifying child of modernity, which at all points remained compatible with its parent that all of the steps taken, when seen in separation, were fully rational. Well, as rational as bureaucracy tends to be. And yet, that they somehow have created an unbelievable barbarity, one that wouldn't be possible without the achievements or the spirit of modernity. By the way, we strongly recommend this book. Despite its heavy subject matter, it's a very approachable way to understand the gist of the beef that Frankfurt School had with modernity. To sum up, the instrumental reason suffers from one problem. When some numbers become valued as something important, it gets a bad case of monkey brains and cares for nothing else in the whole wide world. Just to see those lovely, lovely numbers go up. Anything else is either unrelated or an obstacle to be removed by any means necessary as long as the numbers won't go down. And the irrationality of rationality is simply what we see when we look at this process from a wider angle. 
And so our cities are the result of many of such number maxing schemes. For example, public transport was deemed unprofitable because the only important number was income from ticket sales and not the value coming from actually getting people around town. The badly connected subdivision allowed the city to boast a higher number of new houses and people access to shops and services didn't matter. There have been more traffic jams, so the city was rebuilt to relieve them and make it easier to navigate for the drivers, which incentivized even more people to switch to cars. And again, the city could show off its massive investments in transport infrastructure. And because of all of these rationalizations, people ended up commuting for an even longer time than they have before. It was to get better. It somehow got worse. The irrationality of rationality. But we'll only see these problems if we take a few steps back and walk right into a parked car because recently the pavements have been narrowed to create more parking spaces. However, Kurzgesagt don't think about the transformation of cities to make them more livable for pedestrians, and now we'll see why. And the list goes on, from electric heating and better insulation, to ships traveling at half speed to save fuel. Wherever you look, you find scientists, engineers and entrepreneurs trying to solve some aspect of climate change. Enormous amounts of human ingenuity are being brought to bear on this problem, with more and more people deciding to prioritize preventing rapid climate change. Solutions for low-carbon production of cement, electronics and steel, and innovations like artificial meat and carbon capture are in the works. So we have the hard work of people who can counteract the climate crisis. Scientists, engineers and entrepreneurs. And where are activists, educators, social researchers or urban planners? Well, out of the picture if we look at what our protagonists are working on. These things don't need public debate, cooperation or reflection. The solutions to climate crisis are simply technological. We don't need to change what we do, we just need to do it in green. This is why entrepreneurs are right next to scientists and no one cares about, say, farmers. The solution is technological and economic. This is a huge red flag, because we're dealing with the so-called green growth paradigm, meaning business as usual, but in green. The thing is, green growth is simply a stalling tactic, just like the belief that in order to afford switching to renewables, we first need to burn fossil fuels extra hard. It's just one step ahead. But as they say, show, don't tell. So instead of telling, we'll just show you the next bit, which is probably the most bizarre part of the first video. The more of these technologies we deploy, the cheaper new and better technology gets. The cheaper they get, the more people use them and so on. So that's the whole solution to the climate crisis. The scientists science, the engineers engineer, and the entrepreneurs... entrepreneuriate? Yeah, let's go with that. Entrepreneuriate. And the iron laws of economics make everything cheaper. The only problem is, this is some corporate boardroom talk from the 90s. In our times, the discourse has shifted dramatically, at least in academia. And it's absurd to believe that economy exists in some abstract world of ever-increasing numbers. As we said when we were discussing lithium, economy only works within the limits set by ecology, and we've known that a bit for a quite a while now. The belief that economy is like alchemy and allows us to create something from nothing is hugely antiquated, and regular people are slowly coming to the realization that no, infinite growth on a finite planet is not possible. What's telling is that this video never mentions ecology and it only makes three references to the ecosystems or planetary systems, and it's always in the context of them being destroyed by the climate crisis. This is a really mechanistic view of the world, where A acts upon B and upon C, but that's pretty much all of the complexity of the system. But our situation is better explained by Earth system science and the theory of planetary boundaries, which we've talked about in our video on the Anthropocene. Let's review. The main problem with planetary boundaries is that they interact with each other. For example, the global warming is happening so slowly because 93% of excessive solar energy is being absorbed by oceans. That, however, causes them to acidify. And that leads to biodiversity loss. The most famous example is probably the dying of coral reefs. What that means is we can't simply juggle the problem from one planetary boundary to the next. 
So, for example, we can say that as a part of our fight with climate change, let's exchange all of our engines for electric ones, because that would require a massive excavation of resources, like lithium, on such a scale that we would cause additional disturbances in the planetary system. We used to juggle like that before, and it worked. But only because the system was stable before. It's not anymore. By the way, there's a Netflix documentary on it, called Breaking Boundaries, The Science of Our Planet. Thumbs up. Would recommend. Well, at this point we can just go out and say it. This video is pure propaganda, just one wearing a lab coat and fake glasses from a discount supermarket Halloween costume. Sure, there's a source document which supports all of the particular statements, but 1. The statements themselves are carefully chosen, and 2. The political conclusions look less like something that actual researchers would say, and more like the stuff that's emitted from libertarian think tanks. We can see the impact already. The domestic CO2 output of rich countries is falling without a major recession. Since the year 2000, the EU as a whole shows a 21% decrease, Italy 28%, the UK 35%, Denmark 43%. But the best news may be that emissions are no longer necessarily coupled with the economic growth. In the past, this was an inconvenient truth. To get richer, you had to emit more. Emissions in the Czech Republic dropped 13%, while their GDP grew by 27%. France reduced their CO2 emissions by 14%, while increasing GDP by 15%. Romania saw an 8% decrease and 35% growth. And even the largest economy on Earth, the USA, decreased emissions by 4%, while growing their GDP by 26%. Some of you may call this a numbers trick that rich countries are just exporting emissions to poorer nations by moving the dirty parts of their economies like manufacturing. But even when we account for all of our imported goods, the numbers still look positive. The source document admits that these examples are perhaps not representative, and that this decoupling isn't guaranteed. And that's fine, since the point of this video is simply to show the beginnings of positive trends. Also, if our goal is decarbonization, then the coupling GDP from the emissions is a good and welcome thing. However, here we fall into the numbers trap, and the GDP is only the first of them. GDP, or gross domestic product, is a prime example of what happens when the instrumental reason is left to play unsupervised. It has been invented as a temporary measurement to be used during the Great Depression, but it turned out to be so convenient to use and then say, Hello, general population. Look, we've reached a 3% growth, which means that your lives are now 3% better. Vote for us! And that wasn't only a Western thing, since the USSR also got on the GDP hype train. The basic problem with GDP is that it only shows us the circulation of money. So, if I bike to your place to fix a hole in your wall, and as a thank you, you'll make me a curry using the vegetables you grew in your garden, then GDP won't notice. What it would notice, though, is if you rented a renovation company and I went to dine at McDonald's, even though it would be more expensive and less beneficial for the both of us. Moreover, by focusing only on money flow, GDP ignores the accumulation of wealth as well as non-monetary gains, such as the satisfaction of spending an afternoon together, health benefits from working in your garden, or the benefits of me becoming better as a handyman and helping friends with home repair. Additionally, it ignores the government investment in health or education. Instead of quickly solving your health problem with the help of governmental healthcare, it's better for GDP that you keep bouncing from doctor to doctor paying out of pocket. For as long as possible. Actually, even if you died, you'd still help the GDP growth of that quarter. And as we've seen over the last two years, people dying is fine as long as money keeps circulating. And here we return to Ritzer and his irrationality of rationality. When we overly fixate on maximizing a single factor, we tend to ignore other ones. And as long as they are not converted into numbers, the instrumental mind will tend to downplay them. Well, maybe something should be done here, but it's too complex to model it. What we do might look rational from the point of view of these numbers, but not from any other one. Okay, let's take an example. Say there is some land used by subsistence farmers. If you enclose it, privatize it and make, say, monoculture of soybeans meant for export, 
then the GDP will go up dramatically, even though the hunger will go up as well. That might make instrumental reason go, uh, hunger is up, and in order to deal with it, we need to raise GDP, and evict some more subsistence farmers for more soy monocultures. Donella Meadows, co-author of one of the first serious scientific work regarding natural boundaries, the Club of Rome report titled Limits to Growth, asks plainly, growth of what, and why, and for whom, and who pays the cost, and how long can it last, and what's the cost of the planet, and how much is enough. And these aren't questions which can be easily dealt with using a number or two. But anyway, back to the coupling. The thing is, with the limitations that numbers have, the coupling GDP from the CO2 emissions means as much as the coupling it from horse manure emissions. Maybe it would make sense, but if the climate crisis was the only challenge we're facing. But it is not. So, while the coupling growth from emissions is possible, the coupling from the resource use is questionable. And by questionable, I mean impossible, as Jason Hickel and Giorgio Scalis prove in this paper. In short, one, because there are physical limits to efficiency, and two, because an increase in growth ultimately needs to lead to increase in consumption. Unless, in the future, we'll only be consuming virtual ape avatars or something. But fine, let's assume that we only care about reducing the emissions. Are we able to reach the Paris Agreement goal, reaching zero emissions by 2050? And let's say that we only focus on energy sector and ignore everything else. Well, in order to do that, we'd need to crank up our resource extraction. And that will require one huge crank. Here, Hickel strikes back and uses a 2017 World Bank data to calculate that in the period of 2021 to 2050, the required yearly increase in iron and silver extraction would range from 30 to 100% indium from 300 to 900 percent and our good old friend lithium would need an increase of 2700 and all that again for the next 30 years just to give a visual example the increase in the production of silver from 30 to 100 percent doesn't sound impressive if we only look at the numbers so here's one of the biggest silver mines in the world panesquito in mexico let's quote hickel Covering nearly 40 square miles, the operation is staggering in its scale. A sprawling, open-cast complex ripped into the mountains, flanked by two waste dumps each a mile long, and a tolling dam full of toxic sludge held back by wall that's seven miles around and as high as 50-story skyscraper. In order to make this full switch to renewables, we'd need to open and clean out 130 such mines, and that's just the energy sector. So we would need to get a lot of resources, and cheaply too. Where we can get them? Well, the usual, from the global south. Without a radical change towards our energy use and our growth, we're in for a new wave of green colonialism. And this is why the next segment rings so hollow. It's no longer a matter of having to choose between prosperity and the climate, as it seemed to be a decade ago. Developing countries will profit from that because as rich countries pay for the expensive development of green technologies, they can adopt them more cheaply. They can skip most of the high emission phase that today's rich countries went through. Sure, maybe before 2020 it would sound believable that in the face of global threat, the rich countries will take care of expensive research, allowing poor countries to adapt them cheaply. After all, we're in the same boat, right? And then the pandemic happened, which triggered a race for the cure and for patents. Probably the most famous is the story of the Oxford vaccine, which initially was to be released under an open license, allowing every drug manufacturer to produce it. That, however, changed after an intervention from a large... Charity? Wait, what? Well, uh, the charity expressed its concern, wink wink, nudge nudge, that the university won't be able to perform the required clinical tests by itself. In the grand scheme of things, its chairman said that patents aren't a problem for these manufacturers that are big enough to produce the vaccine and that without a profit motive, no one would want to cure a deadly plague or something. In the end, a license has been granted by AstraZeneca, even though 97% of funding for research came from the government sources. 
we are at the point where not decarbonizing is a bad business decision. Once again, we hear about business and again, only in the context of decarbonization instead of sustainable production, which considers the planetary system. The system gets squeezed in between two numbers, profits on the one side and emissions on the other. Since we've only got a hammer of GDP and emissions, everything else looks like a nail. And we haven't even really talked about solutions like carbon capture. Oh boy. In 2000 it didn't really exist. In 2022 that technology does exist and costs around $600 to remove one ton of CO2 from the atmosphere. As investment pours in and the technology matures and begins to scale, it's likely that these costs will plummet over the next few decades. Again, there's nothing outright false here, but the way this information is presented raises concerns. But in order to understand it, we need to talk about carbon capture. In nature, we've got what it's called a fast and a slow carbon cycle. The fast one is the one involving life. A carbon atom floats as a CO2, a plant absorbs it, grows it into a leaf, the leaf gets eaten by a bunny, the bunny poops, some bacteria decompose the poop, CO2 rises, and another plant grows it into a leaf. The slow cycle takes place in the earth, both in the crust, for example as coal, or in the molten parts below it, like in the CO2 that's emitted by volcanoes. We get global warming when a sufficiently large number of the underground carbon atoms enter the fast cycle. That usually happens as a result of burning, like with us and our fossil fuels. So if we want to stabilize the climate, we need a way to put these carbon atoms back into the slow cycle. Planting trees won't help because they are part of the fast cycle, so they only bind the carbon as long as they are alive. When they decompose or burn, they release the CO2 right back. This is where the idea of carbon capture and storage, or CCS, comes into play. The simplest way to do CCS is to take the CO2 and push it underground between appropriate geological layers, so it stays there and doesn't bother us. However, gases don't really like to stay underground, so finding such a place needs to account for many factors, including seismic activity. There is, however, another way, and this is the one done by the Orca installation on Iceland, which this video talks about. One company, called Climeworks, captures the CO2 from the atmosphere in the process called DAC, or direct air capture. Another company, Carbfix, combines it with water and minerals and injects it a kilometer deep into basalt rock, which mimics the natural processes of weathering by combining the carbon into calcium bicarbonate. And it does it in merely two years, while the natural process takes millennia. Why we are talking about it? To show that carbon capture is a process deeply rooted in the material world, and that while innovation will drive down its price, it still isn't alchemy and we're still subject to physical limits. For example, this is a map of places that are suitable for carbon storage. In all of the other places, capturing CO2 from a power plant or a cement plant will be more difficult because it will require transport to a sequestrating facility, generating additional costs and emissions. Unfortunately, that's not all. We said that Orca uses direct air capture. This is sadly the most energy and resource-intensive way to capture CO2. Orca can afford to be power-hungry because it uses clean and renewable Icelandic geothermal power. But for the rest of the world, this will be a difficult solution, because it can't be run on fossil fuels, so it will use up the newly installed renewable energy capacity, which could be used to prevent further emissions. So, everything's fine then? Well, let's not get carried away. All of these processes are great, but not nearly fast enough. We're still doing way too little, and technology will not magically solve everything. We need to use fewer resources and use them longer, design consumer goods that are repairable and durable, and decrease our energy requirements. We need much better infrastructure, agriculture and cities. It will still be hard work, especially to get the right policies passed and enacted. This part is weird, but also typical for these videos. They acknowledge the problem that might go against what the video says, and then… nothing. It's as if they were put there to placate viewers. Yes, we hear you and your concerns. We know that they are serious and cannot be ignored. Anyway, as we were saying, the scientists and entrepreneurs. 
For example, the key part of these better cities is a massive reduction in the number of cars. However, if they said that, that would clash with their shiny vision of the electric car and ruin their narration of the wonderful progress up in Norway. Here we'll skip a bit on being cautiously optimistic and dive into the difficult topic of climate apathy. The sadness and hopelessness that many people feel is real and very destructive because it causes apathy. Apathy that is only serving the fossil fuel industry that is still delaying change however it can. In a sense, they have weaponized hopelessness. And again, we don't have a problem with the idea that it's very important to have a positive message, but we do have a problem with how what they base this message on. In order to understand it, we need to discuss a trend of thought known as new optimism. New optimism says, hey, I understand you're worried about all of this discrimination, conflicts and disasters that are going on in the world, but... Did you know that they seem so bad only because the modern media are focused on the negative information and that if you look into the past and dig out hard numbers, then you will see that the world is actually getting better? Among the prominent new optimists, you'll find the Swedish statistician Hans Rosling, founder of the Gapminder Foundation and author of Factfulness, as well as the famous or infamous Canadian psychologist by the name of Steven Pinker who wrote The Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now. The main accusation against the new optimists is their methodology, which boils down to graph goes up means world more gooder. Okay, that's an overly sarcastic take on their approach, which seems quite convincing. After all, the numbers don't lie, do they? And they spell disaster for you! The funny thing about numbers, though, is that they also don't tell the truth. Actually, they say nothing at all, because it's us who can make them say anything we want. The new optimists have this art down to a T, by carefully choosing what they want to show and how to show it in order to make the graph go up. Let's take Pinker's 2019 TED talk as an example. He starts by comparing the USA of 2017 and the USA of 1987 in three categories. Homicide, poverty and pollution. Homicides do check out. There's really been a significant decline. Poverty? Not so much. Not only does Pinker's data seem to be lower than the other source we could find, there's also no particular decline. Or to be more precise, the decline stopped in the 70s with the end of the post-war golden age of capitalism. Yet it's the last statistic that is by far the most interesting. Smog and sulfur dioxide pollution. Smog went down by a third. That's nice, but that sulfur, 80% reduction, isn't that progress? Well, yes, kind of. You see, that's a very new optimistic approach. Sulfur pollution and acid rain were indeed a problem, but one that had a technological fix. Basically just fitting chimneys with filters. It looks good in numbers, but it's not an indicator of large-scale progress like homicide rate or poverty. It's just a relatively simple problem with a relatively simple solution. And in case you're wondering why we don't see CO2 on this chart, well, actually, the emissions are going down, but they went up before that, so it would look pretty much the same in the presentation. Later, Pinker comes back to the topic of poverty. Yet, instead of showing a graph for the USA, he shows this famous graph, which is emblematic for both new optimism and its criticism the percentage of people living in extreme poverty from 1820 to 2015. Well, the aforementioned Jason Hickel takes this graph and tears it a new... um... a new data point. First point, this is not a single graph, but two, spliced into one. The red one doesn't represent poverty, but GDP. And if you're surprised to hear that in 19th century we had the tools to estimate the global GDP, then... Yeah, we didn't. Hickel comments that this dataset focuses almost exclusively on Western countries. For the entire continent of Asia and Latin America, it includes data for only three countries each prior to 1900. For Africa, it includes no data at all prior to 1900, and for only three countries prior to 1950. In other words, for the vast majority of the human population and for the vast majority of the time period in question, there isn't any data at all. 
That's not statistics. That's just some numbers mixed with wood chips and cornstarch, put through a blender, forced into baking mold the shape of statistics, and cooked the self-congratulatory excitement of a TED Talk audience. Best served hot. Serving suggestion. Do not freeze, refrigerate, or examine. Serves one. The one percent, that is. Anyway, second point. The threshold of extreme poverty is set at $1.90, independent of the country. For example, this is the equivalent of 35 people trying to survive in Britain on a single minimum wage, without any benefits, borrowing or gifts. Well, okay, someone might say, but that's rich countries. What about poorer ones, where it's cheaper to live? Well, it turns out that the number of these people living in extreme poverty is similar to the number of people experiencing hunger. Not food insecurity, but real hunger. So, for example, going a day without food. So, it's not enough to afford food, but perhaps enough to ward off literal starvation. But at least it's getting better, right? Right? Well, kind of, says Hickel. If you omit China with its state-planned economy, then the poverty rate seems to nearly stagnate. In fact, if it keeps decreasing at the rate it does since 1981, which is the first year of which we have data, then the poorest will achieve income allowing for normal life expectancy, $7.40, in a mere 200 years. Okay, enough numbers. Let's talk about how they are being used. From our point of view, it looks like praise for the instrumental mind. Pinker, in all of his fuss on the Enlightenment, seems to miss the most obvious point, that the Enlightenment was an act of self-reflection. Basically, he's arguing for the same thing as Adorno and Horkheimer, only he's kind of like, saying that it's good? It seems like the Enlightenment has invented such great tools that it actually freed us from the burden of reflection. More Enlightenment means progress, and if you're in any way critical of it, you know, the same way that the Enlightenment thinkers were critical of the existing social order, then that means you're a progressive who hates progress. And that's the thing. We could very well imagine some 18th century new optimists showing us stats that nowadays fewer and fewer kings fall into madness, the peasants are working harder than ever, and thanks to the wondrous progress of missionaries in the new world, an unprecedented number of people get to experience the light of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and some of them even manage to go life through it. So, what would be the reaction of the Pinkerian Enlightenment thinkers if they were presented with an empirical decrease in the insanity of kings and increase in productivity of peons and the number of Christians? Well, they'd say that this is just a cheap praise for the monarchy and the church. And unfortunately, this is what the new optimism mostly boils down to. Since what we're doing seems to be working, there's no need to make any marked improvements or reflect or anything. So, if we only look in the past, we end up reinforcing it. Well, you might say, all this sounds similar to what you've been saying since the start. That's right, kiddo. One of the people associated with the thought is Max Roser, the founder of Our World in Data, who have done the research on these Kurzgesagt videos. It doesn't mean that the world itself is fake. It isn't. But that we need to be skeptical on what is being presented and how it's being interpreted. Now comes a rousing speech that since we did so much in spite of all the hardships, we can do even more. We are interested in the last part, that we... To turn that three degrees into a two degrees, and then see where we can go from there. For that, we need hope. And we hope we gave you that today, at least a little. That you feel that things are serious, but also that you have a future. That you can have kids without dooming them or the world. That taking action today is worth it and that despite powerful industries doing everything to delay it, society is changing. And there's a lot of problems we have with that last sentence. It seems like an attempt getting the viewer to join the popular front of us versus them, with us being rebellious folk, mostly young ones, if we look at the protest images. And the thing is that this division, just as their approach to the climate crisis, is kind of outdated. Well, sure, in the climate war there's still intense fighting going on between the valiant activists and the evil fossil fuel lobbyists, but everyone in the second camp who's in the know already knows that this front is lost, and that they need to fall back to their second line of defenses. 
And that means still doing the dirty energy business and exploiting the global south, but this time in green. And this is the ugly part of this call to action. It's not like climate activists only care about their own backyard and want to launch a new wave of colonialism going out with signs that say No system change! No climate change! Make Global South the planet B! Screw the lithium triangle in particular! Or keep wind turbines white! Ugh, uh, that one was too much, I'll cut it in post. The climate movement as it stands now goes very much hand in hand with the fight for global and social justice. And this is spot where the real powers that be want to drive a wedge in. That popular fight can be lost even if we defeat the fossil fuel lobby. Kurzgesagt did announce a new video about what can we do as individuals and it might prove us wrong, but it probably won't because you see, they have a particular political agenda which can be seen if we take a look at the previous video. Well then, onwards. The title is Can you fix climate change? It mostly deals with the issue of how the climate problem is complex and why the idea of personal responsibility is smoke and mirrors. Because what is important is systemic change. We're going to omit even more here. This is why you should watch the whole thing, because it's somehow both better and worse. Modern industrial society as we constructed it in the last 150 years is inherently destructive to the planet. Basically, everything we do to make our lives easier, safer and more comfortable is making things worse for the biosphere. We need to stop here for a moment because it's not like the 150 years ago our civilization simply became destructive. The switch to fossil fuels, on the way from horse manure, did not create its destructive logic, only extended its capabilities. According to American sociologist Jason Moore, the destructive logic appeared in the 1400s with the building of first colonial plantation on the Portuguese island of Madeira, which created the template for the system of colonial exploitation of both people and nature, or of the so-called cheap nature. Let's make a quick recap of the term from our video on the capitalocene. So we take a bit of chalk, draw a circle and say, okay, this is the inside where we pay for stuff and this is the outside where we don't pay for stuff. To put it simply, what if creating wealth in the era of global capitalism is just moving stuff from the outside to the inside and putting a price tag on it? All is a single thing which changes over time. We can call it planetary metabolism, or the sum of all material processes happening on the planetary scale. Moore calls it the web of life, from which nature and society arise, and both of them are purely ideological constructs. What we call society is the people and places that we respect, and nature is everything else. The result is, paradoxically, most of the people in history, and especially in the colonies, was part of the nature. Economy is the way of distinguishing which part of this web of life has a monetary value and which doesn't. Slaves were considered so-called cheap nature because their labor was free, but similarly, the soil in the plantation is also cheap nature. The labor of soil and the labor of plants is also free. So for the last 150 years the main change was that we started to treat atmosphere as cheap nature and we've sorta run out of it. The problem is that until the second half of the 20th century we've only destabilized local ecosystems, so we were dependent on them. If we plundered our ecosystem back home it would be we who felt the consequences. However, Colonialism allowed us to circumvent this problem and replace these cheap natures using transoceanic trade. We just plundered and created huge colonies on the frontier, and the frontier was always moving. If we ran out of soil fertility in a plot of land, well, there was always more of this no man's land to claim, just over that hill. I mean, sure, there were some human beings living there, but since they didn't have any plantations, it was obvious that they were savages and we needed to unleash some civilization upon them, preferably making them just another cheap nature workforce for working on our cheap nature fields. At the present moment we're experiencing what it's like to live in a world that has run out of frontiers and of cheap natures, and that means that we finally need to maintain some semblance of balance between what ecosystems can produce and what we can get from them, or what we dump in them. There are many grey areas in the fight against rapid climate change. The most prominent one is the divide between rich and poor. This is a messy issue, because the poor countries can be used in two ways in such discussion. 
On the one hand, we've got the climate justice movement, on the other, these countries can be used as bargaining chips to distract us from the climate crisis. As an example, we've got eco-modernists, don't worry, we will explain the term in a bit, such as Michael Schellenberger, one of the founders of Breakthrough Institute, which is like the Heartland Institute, but for climate, saying that he is a progressive, sure, but we need to remember that problems of poor countries are more important than this whole climate change thing, which is blown out of proportions anyway, and what they need is more fossil fuels. When it comes to fast fashion, he has this to say. I think that one of the most important environmental questions is how do we help really poor countries to industrialize, particularly with clothing factories, or what you might call sweatshops. And I wrote this part, uh, you and I were at an event last year, and I spoke to some young women that felt guilty for buying clothes made in developing countries. And I, I said, that's not right. You should want to buy clothes made in developing countries because you're creating jobs for young women in the cities who are then able to spend money on food, and that results in agriculture becoming more intensified and protecting more natural area. And so for me, it sounds strange, but increasing manufacturing in poor countries, whether it's Ethiopia or the Congo or Indonesia or the Philippines, is really an important environmental question. And, and we should stop demonizing fast fashion. And we should you know, go into go into H&M and Banana Republic and buy a lot of clothes because that creates a beneficial, mm. uh, virtuous cycle in poor countries. Of course, Kurt Gesagt are way above his level. But they still believe that the current model is mostly fine and that it will benefit those countries eventually. This is why, in these kinds of discussion, it's very important to see where the proponents of an idea place agency. Do they tell the global north to take care of the poor countries, or do they give them a voice and autonomy, allowing them to present their own demands? We'll see how it goes in the end of this video. We will soon need to feed 10 billion people, and we don't know how to do that without emitting greenhouse gases. Because of the nature of modern food production that requires fertilizers or manure, it's impossible to have zero emissions food. Two segments back, we said that we need to maintain balance between us and the ecosystem. And the modern farming isn't it. So isn't it. To be clear, though we call it modern, the Haber-Bosch process, which allowed for mass production of artificial fertilizer, is over a hundred years old. Compared to our current understanding of biology and ecology, Farming as monocultures, basically these huge pots that require fertilization, herbicides and pesticides in order to work, seems quite outdated, because it's the old paradigm of man mastering nature. But it does a good job in two key areas, McDonaldization and GDP. Because you see, it's not that feeding the world is a problem, especially if we consider a practice known as agroecology, which is a properly modern way of farming, which instead of mastering nature, actively works alongside it. That's why these farms don't require fertilizing or even tilling, and after a few years of initial investment, the costs go down, and resilience to natural catastrophes goes up. And all of that comes with higher nutritional value per the same area. That, however, comes with the aforementioned drawbacks in McDonaldization and GDP. The crops are far more seasonal and varied, which makes them more suited for consumption and local trade than for wholesale countrywide or even international distribution. And since such a farmer doesn't really buy fertilizers, herbicides or seeds, they might end up being detrimental to the GDP. It's like the cartoon we saw a while back of a boardroom meeting and this one guy was saying, yes, this could save many lives, but at what cost? All the talk about the feeding the world sounds nice, but it's incomplete without one important idea, food sovereignty which means that countries and communities should be able to feed themselves and not be subject to global food or farming markets, because that gives the rich countries or corporations an enormous leverage against them. This is one of the reasons that GMOs are such a hot topic even for the scientifically literate activists. The problem doesn't lie in the technology itself, it almost never does. It lies in politics and some technologies, like agroecology are more conductive to more equal politics than others. So again, it's not about crying crocodile tears over the poor countries and giving them a baby bottle, it's about giving them a voice and a real ability to choose. The same holds true for other things that are less crucial to our survival, but frankly not realistic to make go away. Like air travel, overseas shipping, mining and the production of devices that play YouTube videos. So what does this mean? Do we need to give up our way of life, and can the poor never achieve it? Can't some technology save us so we can continue to drive our big cars and eat meat every day? 
That's a hyperbole, but ultimately this is what the video boils down to. Three choices, giving up on our way of life or getting some technology to maintain it. Again, we are stuck in the trap of the instrumental reason. We just have one way of life and one value, growth. So in order to maintain it, we need to supplement one number, the GDP, with another, emissions. But this, again, makes us forget about the real rationality, which means taking a step back and analyzing why we ended up in this situation, thinking of what values are important to us instead of just maintaining the numbers. In principle, this technology already exists. Direct air capture of CO2 draws carbon dioxide from the air so that it can be stored underground or transformed into products. So why aren't we implementing it in every industry everywhere? Because with the technology we have right now, this would cost some $10 trillion per year, or half the United States GDP. In all of the videos, a DIC installation is used as a visual shorthand for progress and technology. Sure, DIC is possible and may be necessary, although that issue is not so clear-cut. For example, the climatologist and activist Michael Mann argues otherwise in his New Climate War. But what's important is that it's hugely energy-intensive, and that's a good segue into the world of the future, filled with amazing machines. And if you want to have a great technology and ecology, there's no better place to look than eco-modernism. In 2015, Breakthrough Institute published the Eco-Modernist Manifesto, which thinks of Anthropocene as a chance for both achieving prosperity and taking care of nature. Thanks to technological innovations, the population growth is decreasing, just like resource use, people in the whole world are living better lives, and there is no reason to think that this trend will stop. Well, there are some problems, like climate change, but ultimately they are not that significant, because soon we'll achieve decoupling. So growing our economy, and at the same time reducing resource usage which will allow us to give more and more land back to nature, while people will thrive in sustainable cities. The problem of fossil fuels can be easily solved using technology and proper regulations, while taking care that developing countries reach the civilization level of developed countries. To sum up with a quote, we write with the conviction that knowledge and technology applied with wisdom might allow for a good or even great Anthropocene. In degrowth response to the Ecomodernist Manifesto, environmental, social and economic scholars have chastised Ecomodernists for being neither eco nor modern, and basically just being greenwashed modernists. Let's go through their main points of critique one by one, because we'll use them later on. The Manifesto assumes that growth is a given. Ecomodernists believe in the myth of decoupling growth from impacts. Is technology the problem or the solution? The eco-modernists cannot decide. In the past, technology ruined the environment, but in the future, it will save it. How? Because in the past we were stupid, but in the future we will be smart. Somehow. The manifest doesn't clarify how it will happen, but it looks like the logic behind saying I was too lazy today, but tomorrow I'll definitely start working out. Eco-modernism is not very eco. It ignores almost everything we know about ecology and thermodynamics, especially the bit about, you know, things having limits. It also treats all of the damage done to the Earth system as easily reversible. The manifesto has a narrow, inaccurate and whitewashed view of both modernity and development. It treats the European model of development as the only possible one, and the modernity as blessing which came without any downsides. Never mind the whimpering killjoys like Weber, Ritzer or Baumann. Ecomodernism is condescending towards pre-industrial, agrarian and non-industrialized societies and the global south. They are all under-civilized and need to be given modernity, which will be centralized top to bottom and the same for everybody. The manifesto suffers from factual errors and misleading statements. For example, it says that three-fourths of deforestation happened before the Industrial Revolution, which proves that humans have been destructive since forever. Sounds legit, until you understand that what they're saying is that in the last 250 years we did a third of the destruction done in the whole Homo sapiens history. So for the last 200,000 years. To sum up. Ecomodernism looks like using technology for window dressing instead of solving the underlying issues, 
and the Kurzgesagt videos seem to be uncomfortably close to this approach at times. However, that was the goal of this manifesto, to push the Overton window away from the realistic solutions by creating a vision of the future that is so absurdly techno-optimistic that it makes the regular techno-optimism seem like a middle-of-the-road solution. What's more important is that from today's standpoint, ecomodernism seems so anachronistic, just as the modernists of old were fascinated by huge, powerful and fast locomotives, cars and planes, the eco-modernists of today are fascinated by huge, powerful and efficient direct air capture installations. The approach is the same. The more powerful the machine, the more powerful the genius of its creators. And it is again that man, endowed with reason, is contrasted with the mindless nature which he seeks to master. Only this time by building machines which are both powerful and efficient. But again, we've just added another set of numbers. First it was only power, now it's power and efficiency. But we still ignore everything that doesn't serve our purpose. And that's how we ended up in an abstract world, where the only limitation to DAC is money, and we only see nature as a way to make DAC cheaper. Meanwhile, very costly solutions for a far-off problem, like carbon capture, seem like they can wait, as technically nobody benefits from it right now. Some argue that a move away from capitalism is the only solution to this mess. Others insist that markets should be even freer, without any interventions like subsidies. And some suggest that we need what's referred to as degrowth, and to cut back as a species overall. Okay, hands up everyone who groaned at some point. And it's interesting to see when. Normally we don't criticize the visualization, but this one is really something. While it seems to show two ends of a spectrum, a capitalist and an anti-capitalist solution, it's also giving us a choice. So, dear viewer, what would you prefer? Some circling coins and a floating shopping cart? Or, um, a nuclear explosion? It's like these fake polls on Facebook, which are like, leave a like for option 1 and leave an angry reaction for option 2. It's not much better in the source materials where the authors say that it's a nuanced topic and it's hard to do it justice, so they present either free market solution or nationalization of fossil fuel industry? That's it guys, we've nationalized BP, like it was in the 70s. Capitalism is no more. It would be more fair to discuss some strands of eco-socialism, but you see, this wasn't actually the most ideologically loaded part of this segment. This honor goes to their description of degrowth, which is so bloody dishonest, even though it seems okay on a superficial level, if you don't know what it is. It's a bit like defining feminism as a way of achieving gender equality by granting additional privileges to women. Like, okay, a part of feminism deals with this, and it fits literal meaning of the word, but that's such a loaded definition that, if it was your first introduction to the topic, you'd already be biased. It's not much better in the sources, which say that degrowth groups argue that we cannot both continue to consume more resources and also protect our planet from environmental damage. The solution is instead to limit and even reverse our growth. And the source quotation that goes along with it seems to be supporting their point. It's just less growth, nothing more. It actually comes from some blog post on degrowth.info, which has a useful link on the main page that everyone can click. And it says, Degrowth is an idea that critiques the global capitalism system which pursues growth at all costs, causing human exploitation and environmental destruction. The degrowth movement of activists and researchers advocates for societies that prioritize social and ecological well-being instead of corporate profits, overproduction and excess of consumption. This requires radical redistribution, reduction in the material size of the global economy, and a shift in common values towards care, solidarity, and autonomy. Degrowth means transforming societies to ensure environmental justice and a good life for all within planetary boundaries. There, it wasn't that hard, now was it? But now we see the reason why Kurzgesagt treats degrowth so unfairly. Simply put, degrowth is their political opponent. Kurzgesagt argue for the growth of GDP and better technology as a fix for everything, while degrowth wants us to reconsider our priorities. So, to stop looking at it from the perspective of instrumental reason and simply ask, what is the economy for? Okay, so let's discuss degrowth a little more. This is the hidden truth that the Illuminati at Kurzgesagt don't want you to know. 
Sure, degrowth may mean a reduction in growth, but it only concerns the GDP and isn't the goal, just the byproduct. The main assumption of degrowth is that we must let go of our obsession with the economic growth, especially when we don't really have a way of transforming the growth to regular folks. In the 21st century, there's simply no place for the approach from the early 1900s, that growth will somehow magically translate into well-being for everyone. The idea of degrowth is that we may use our resources in a much more rational way and create an economy which will actually benefit people. Degrowth asks, Perhaps we don't need the whole industry of cafes, pubs and bars just to have a place to meet with friends in a city built for cars, even electric ones. Perhaps instead of sitting indoors, because that's the only place with AC, we could spend time strolling in the shade of trees, on quiet streets with minimal traffic. That is, perhaps we could satisfy human needs in a more direct way. Oh right, needs. Currently, capitalism doesn't meet human needs. It actually inflates them because a fulfilled and happy person doesn't compensate it by overconsumption. And it's, you know, bad for the economy if we don't overconsume things. Did the ad for your phone say that using the new and amazing camera you'll be able to capture all of the amazing moments with your friends? And yet you end up using your phone for switching between the same four apps. Oh look, a beer ad showing how much fun you and your gang are having. Well, you were supposed to meet up for board games this evening, but your schedules didn't sync, so you'll drink the beer watching Netflix. Again. You were kinda hoping to focus on your hobbies today, but you were just too exhausted after work for the last few weeks. Well, months really. And you'll have to be careful of how much you drink, because alcohol interacts with your new medication for the mild anxiety and depression disorder. Yeah, it turns out that there's some chemical imbalance in your brain that makes you unhappy after filling out Excel sheets in an open plan office for 8 hours every day. But hey, at least we're getting growth, right? And here the growth gets close to the cheap nature theory. Just as we colonize every nook and cranny of nature to squeeze out every last bit and piece of value, we colonize our society and ourselves. These four apps are probably social network running apps which are like fracking your brain for the last milliseconds of your attention, perhaps by selling you other wellness apps or coaching programs designed to let you better cope with the increasing stress and workload, so you can be more productive. So we end up with exhausted ecosystems supporting exhausting societies composed of exhausted people. But hey, at least we're getting growth, right? And a rising tide lifts all boats. So any day now everything will get better, the apartments will get cheaper, you won't have to work so much, you'll finally be able to meet with your friends. Degrowth says, let's do so right now. If you enjoy meeting friends, let's organize our society in order to do that easier, without the need to drive a one and a half ton box to the city center every day to sit in an air-conditioned skyscraper and order takeouts just to manufacture more boxes, skyscrapers and takeout dishes. Because that is what the economy needs. And what Kurzgesagt seems to say is that economy needs it to fuel progress and allow us to do the same thing. But this time emissions free. So ideas like degrowth represent future and change. And now, let's listen to a segment which tells us why change isn't possible. But the truth is, at least as of now, no political system is doing an impressive job at becoming truly sustainable, and none have really done so in the past. We also don't have the time to figure this out and do a lot of experiments. We must implement solutions now. Not just to halt the release of all possible greenhouse gases, but also to start reducing the amount of CO2 in the air. It's too late to just mend our ways, we have to actively correct our past mistakes. With every year we waste, more extreme changes will be unavoidable. Okay, let's take a deep breath. Rapid climate change and the world we live in are complicated. So here is where you, dear viewer, come in again. Could you please fix the climate? So we don't have the time to step back and think things over. We need to act now so we need to act in the same way. The next segment talks about how individual responsibility doesn't work. We, 100%, wholeheartedly agree there. So we'll just show two most important points. 
A narrative of our time is that we are all responsible for rapid climate change. Personal contributions towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions are nice, but they are dwarfed by the systemic reality of global emissions. The concept of your personal carbon footprint was popularized by the oil producer BP in a 2005 ad campaign. Arguably one of the most effective and sinister pieces of propaganda that still seriously distracts all of us from the reality of the situation. If you eliminated 100% of your emissions for the rest of your life, you would save one second's worth of emissions from the global energy sector. And we're getting close to the finish, so we're getting some solutions. We have struggled a long time with this, which is why this video took us so long to make. We don't know who's right, so we can only offer you the Kurzgesagt perspective and opinion. Opinion part. What can you actually do? We need a different way to think and talk about rapid climate change. An all-encompassing systemic approach, nothing less than changing the fundamentals of our modern industrial societies. For systemic changes in technology, politics and the economy of this magnitude, we need to influence the people at the levers. Politicians need to know and feel strongly that the people care, that their own success depends on tackling rapid climate change. When governments and local politicians are reluctant to change laws that affect their biggest tax contributors or campaign donors, we need to vote them out and vote in people who respect science. Let's keep this bit about respecting science in the back of our heads, and for now, let's discuss something else, since we've got the DAC machine on the screen anyway. So, last time we talked about DAC, we criticized eco-modernists and their antiquated future. So now, let's take a look at their opposite, solar punk. It's not easy to define solar punk. It's a notion somewhere between philosophy, art and activism. While the punk suffix alludes to cyberpunk and steampunk, unlike them, it doesn't focus on cyberpunk's technological dystopia or steampunk's Victorian status quo. Visually, solarpunk is based on the aesthetics of Latin America and Afrofuturism, Studio Ghibli movies and Art Nouveau. Ideologically, solarpunk is a vision of the future that is optimistic, but also realistic, where humanity has been victorious in their fight for climate not by mastering the world, but by becoming its custodian and gardener, and taking its proper place in the ecosystem. What's more important, it's that this isn't some reactionary reject modernity, return to monkey, but a vision of the world where we do have the high-tech, just it takes its proper place by becoming a harmonious part of both the planet and the local community. Solarpunk is a shepherd who uses aerial photography and drones to go get sheep to the part of pasture that needs trimming and they are able to repair the drones, shear the sheep and knit a sweater by themselves. This is a vision of the world where we don't need to be subject to nature like pre-modern people, nor struggle to control it, the way modern people and Kurzgesagt do. Instead, in this world, we know how to cooperate. But to achieve such a world, we need to rebel against the systems of today. Yep, solarpunk is political to the bone, so much that it has its own manifesto. Let's quote from it. The punk in solar punk is about rebellion, counterculture, post-capitalism, decolonialism and enthusiasm. So let's try juxtaposing it with its biggest enemy, that is, eco-modernism. And we'll do it using the six points from before. We'll skip the last one since it doesn't apply here. The manifesto assumes that growth is a given. Solar punk instead puts resilience and sustainability first and states outright, if we want to live well, even very well, we don't need more, we just need a smarter way to allocate our resources and efforts. For example, we don't need to give up on smartphones, we just need to give up on non-upgradable smartphones which need to be exchanged every two years. Eco-modernists believe in the myth of decoupling growth from impacts. No comments needed here, I think. Is technology the problem or the solution? The eco-modernists cannot decide. In Solarpunk, the technology is a necessary but not sufficient condition of the solution. There should be more focus on how to use what we have now, instead of hoping that creating new ones will solve things. More often than not, the new technology used in the old way will suck just as much. So we first need to radically change our politics before technology becomes a solution. Additionally, Solarpunk doesn't mind using simple and low-tech solutions if they do the job. Eco-modernism is not very eco. 
The whole deal with Solarpunk is about us fitting into planetary boundaries. The manifesto has a narrow, inaccurate and whitewashed view of both modernity and development. Quite the opposite. Solarpunk believes in bottom-up ideas, which should be adjusted to local social and environmental conditions. Trying to work out a one-size-fits-all solution is a waste of effort, both for homes and for models or development. Should we choose hydroponics or regenerative agriculture? Both depending on need. Ecomodernism is condescending towards pre-industrial agrarian and non-industrialized societies and the global south. Here again, the decentralized solar punk has a different approach. We need to take a closer look at these societies, especially indigenous ones, since, you know, they managed not to wreck their ecosystems to the point of extinction. And that means they may have some good ideas we could adapt. Let's take, for example, Terra Preta, a kind of fertile soil from Amazonia, which was artificially produced about 2500 years ago, or perhaps even earlier. It inspired the development of biochar, a kind of charcoal that can be produced not only from wood, but from other materials. Additionally, research is still being done on the microbial makeup of Terra Preta, which gives it its amazing stability and regenerative abilities. By using this technology, we will be able to both fertilize the soil and permanently bind carbon from the atmosphere, all using DIY methods. And let this Terra Preta serve as a perfect example of solar punk. This is the true spirit of human genius, reaching through ages and continents to offer us a solution. Not Prometheus stealing fire from the gods, but a human remembering the soil of their ancestors. We don't need to be powerful, strong, fast, all-knowing. We just need to be smart. In the meantime though, let's go back to our video, where the bigger the DAC, the progressor the progress. There's no reason that the profit interests of industries could not match the need to reduce carbon emissions as much as possible. And if they still don't cooperate, harsh punishments and regulation need to force or bankrupt them. We've already talked about the profits, but this part about taxation is especially interesting, because it's one of the few political proposals. So let's keep it in mind for later. But more companies will make more efficient carbon capture systems, tasty meat alternatives, better batteries, cement alternatives and so on if there's a clear and growing demand. And if you're affluent enough, you can do your part by investing in these things right now while they're still expensive. These are the mechanisms that will drive the prices down later on. But the price of things doesn't... You know what? I've had it. Say cheaper again. Say cheaper again. Come on! Say cheaper again, I dare ya, I double dare ya, say cheap one more time. Planetary boundaries, Elon Musk, -er. do you speak them? So this is basically what you can do. Vote at the ballot, vote with your wallet. Okay, so Kurt Gesagt are mainstream video creators, so it's not surprising that they are offering a mainstream solution. But can we take a moment to appreciate how the most normy thing is presented as this ultimate act of rebellion? How this badass bird goes to smash the system by voting for Biden and buying a Tesla? Okay, it's time to take a look at the choice which Kurzgesagt gives you. In the world, there are two wolves. I mean, forces. The evil empire of fossil fuel lobbyists and the brave rebels of green activists and politicians who respect science. But is that the whole picture? From what we've seen, Kurzgesagt's approach to science is quite... lax. Basically, science, or more properly, technology, is used just for a single purpose, as an escape from politics. They ignore not only alternative economical approaches, but the very fact that economy must exist within ecology. This isn't respecting science. This is just distracting us with shiny gadgets. You see, this is what people well, smart people, mean when they say that science has become modern religion, that it has become our comforter from the evils of the uncaring universe. And this is the role it plays in the video as well. Brothers in science, have you fear of the future? Brothers in science, fear not, because lo and behold, and cast your eyes upon actions of the Trinity, as scientists, engineers and entrepreneurs in perfect harmony weave the body of our church, which will lead us not into emotionality, but deliver us from the nature. Elon. 
Yep, this has as much to do with science as fantasies from a hundred years ago, that in the year 2000 people will eat a whole meal in one pill. Modern science is the quest of studying all of the systemic complexities, while Kurzgesagt would like to flatten them, cover with low emissions concrete and place DAC machines on top. This vision of the future seems so bloody anachronistic, like it was developed by some 80s or 90s corporate executives. Of course, this is neither science nor popular science, but simple propaganda. And as every propaganda, this one also serves political goals, to escape politics, as we said. This, however, is impossible, so the only things you end up running away from is… changes. That's why, in the end, this video is simply a pat on the back for a system that we had in place since the 80s. Neoliberalism Neoliberalism, or to put it shortly, market fundamentalism, is a belief that everything should function as a market and the public sphere should be privatized as much as possible, because markets will regulate themselves. Okay, so maybe this is some neoliberalism plus, because in this version the state can intervene and tax some branches of the economy in order to subsidize others. But it still shouldn't introduce any social programs, or redistribution, or even tax the rich, even though they are the highest emitters. Yes, even if we take into account the differences inside countries. And if you are wondering why, then we're finally about to get the last piece of the puzzle. Because now, past the end of the video, we get an ad. Wanna know what ad we get? This video was supported by Gates Notes, the personal blog of Bill Gates, where he writes about global health, climate change and more. And now we see that why these videos seem like they've been written by an IT's corporate boss. Because they have been written by an IT's corporate boss. Of course, let's not fall into conspiracy thinking. It's not that Gates forced Kurzgesagt to write it. They have a whole article on how they accept sponsorships and that it is Kurzgesagt that need to have the final say on everything. They are not sponsored by Gates to make them agree with him, they are sponsored by Gates precisely because they already agree with him. Ok, now that we've done the big reveal, let's be frank. For the whole duration of the video we were doing our best to hold back and not overly criticize what we were commenting. But from the point of view of what experts are saying, I mean not economists or billionaires, but environmental experts, all of this stuff seems like it's 20 to 30 years old. It brings to mind Peter Isherwell, the billionaire philanthropist from the Don't Look Up movie. When an earth-shattering comet was hurtling towards our planet, Isherwell believed that its mineral contents constituted unbelievable chance for our economy. So we need to give up on the reliable ways of destroying the comet and instead use hyper-advanced drones to mine it. When scientists pointed out flaws in his plan and its impracticality, they were fired for being narrow-minded. Similarly here, science is seen as subservient to economic growth. This is especially visible in the case of their geoengineering video, also sponsored by Gates Foundation. It focuses mostly on SAI, or stratospheric aerosol injection, which is spreading a thin layer of dust in the upper parts of the atmosphere in order to decrease the incoming sunlight, temporarily lowering the temperature and give us time to finally deal with the climate change. The conclusion is that it's a horrible idea, but we might want to need it to do it anyway, despite the fact that the absolute majority of environmental experts, except for some who actively study geoengineering and are often friends with Gates, are firmly against it, stating that the science is still too immature. The video sums it up, however, as short-sighted and mentions that global warming is already a huge geoengineering experiment. Like having two bad experiments makes the second one in some way better. It's not hard to guess then that Gates sponsors geoengineering research since at least 2007. And, since we're on the topic of investing, this $600 price tag for sequestrating a ton of carbon is a bulk price for Gates, among others, since he's one of the larger investors in both Climeworks and Carbfix. In his book, he even boasts about being the biggest investor in the field. Similar issue is with Breakthrough Energy, a fund to invest in green energy, which also sponsored other Kurzgesagt videos. But let's not gear our hopes up. With Gates, philanthropy comes second, and business always comes first. Remember what we said about the Oxford vaccine and the mysterious charity that intervened to ensure a closed license? Yeah, that was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Gates in general is known in the world of public health as a huge supporter of patents, 
probably because he is the single person in the world who gained the most from intellectual property laws. In order to understand why, we need to look at the history of his company, Microsoft, which achieved success using some, well, not very savory business practices. We'll describe just one. Microsoft missed out on the introduction of the World Wide Web, and the dominant browser back then was Netscape Navigator, which you needed to buy, like most software at the time. Microsoft then created Internet Explorer based on code by a company called Spyglass Incorporated, in return for a quarterly fee and portion of the sales. Using the best business practices of the 90s, Gates bundled the browser for free with their system. He finished off his competitor, screwed over his partner, and was able to focus on what Microsoft was famous for, the strategy called Embrace, Extend, Extinguish. Really, that's how they called it in their internal memos. To embrace an existing standard, extend it in a way that tied users to Microsoft products in order to finally extinguish all the other implementations. In the late 90s and the early aughts, Microsoft basically acted like a cartoon villain. So he's not only a corporate boss, but like the final boss of all corporate bosses. We mentioned his book earlier. Yes, we read it as a part of our research, and it's more or less like these videos. Have good ideas, have glaring omissions, with some outlandish ideas sparkled on top. For example, one of his two solutions for food waste is smart bins, which scan what you chuck in them and display the carbon footprint. No, we're not doing a bit here. That's really what it says. It's also interesting how little attention he gives to trains in comparison with a new generation of Jet biofuels? Oh, right. Gates is also one of the owners of Signature Aviation, world's biggest provider of private jet infrastructure. With all that we've set up to now, it's almost superfluous to say that he invests a lot in meat alternatives, which are so often mentioned in these videos. But there's still one thing that Gates invests in. Well, two. It's probably no surprise that he invests strongly in Kurzgesagt. In 2015, he offered $570,000 for videos on health and vaccination. The climate videos are sponsored by other subsidiaries he controls. And the second one is Our World in Data, who cooperated with Kurzgesagt in creating these videos and others. So we've got a happy media bubble of people patting their backs, sponsored by one of the richest people on the planet. And basically acting as an ad agency for him. Okay, but enough about the climate solutions from a literal boomer and one of the richest people in the world who, in the face of climate crisis, finally discovered that the government can be good sometimes, actually, if it can give you free money and strangle your competition. So, the mask strategy. <laughs> what can we learn from this? The basic conclusion is that there are no non-ideological solutions to the climate crisis just ones that support the ruling ideology of historical exploitation of other people, countries, and nature. It's just being called human greed and obsession with short-term profit. And since the videos like these ones are being made, it seems like this ideology is no longer so obvious and it needs some propping up. So let's talk about our hope. Not the blind capitalist hope that progress will solve all the problems and stop any changes. We can look further and we can place our hope actually in the future. This is why we mentioned Solarpunk, because while it's an abstract idea, it seems to be gaining steam. I mean, solar. Just try searching for it on YouTube. Finally, we can give our opinion. But it's going to be more difficult for us than for Kurzgesagt, because of one strange phenomenon. Say, we're in a classroom, and the teacher asks two kids how much is 21 times 37. If Bobby answers, I don't know, and Billy says, Four, then the teacher will probably reprimand Billy that you shouldn't make stuff up. But if it happened in the real world, and in the realm of politics, there's a special kind of political mind that says to Bobby, see, you don't even know, but you have the audacity to correct Billy. At least he's given some kind of answer. That's the same case with these Kurzgesagt videos. We get an answer that is completely wrong, though obviously less so than Billy's, but it's still going to get extra points for, well existing and offering some solace. Does it offer solace though? Or is it just a distraction? Meanwhile, our answer is, we don't know. And also, we don't need to. Because just as with that multiplication, this answer can also be calculated, even if it takes a lot more time and requires a lot more people. Fortunately, we don't need to do it in a top-down way. 
and that's why we juxtapose the ecomodernism and solar punk. The solution won't come from sparkling heavenly labs of some Bezos, Gates or Musk. It'll come from the ground up. From the street protest, from a local council, from a garden. And if you're worried that this answer will be too small or that it won't have the strength to break through, just remember that it doesn't need to. The climate crisis is not some monolith that we need to break in half with one fierce blow. It's a huge network of interconnected problems, many of which are small and very pedestrian. No, it doesn't mean voting with your wallet. That actually has all the cons of regular voting and then some, and very few of its pros. But that's a topic for another time. What we ask is that you get organized. Join climate protests, urban activists, permaculture movements, art collectives, or even groups advocating for social justice. Because we'll need every last one in order not to repeat the story with French yellow vests. There's a lot of stuff to do aside from research and voting, gardening, activism, protests, art, education, financial support, counseling, sustainable construction, household appliance repairs, hacking. There's a place for almost everyone in this huge web. Even marketing specialists can help by signal-boosting worthwhile initiatives instead of selling useless crap. Same thing with protests. They are important, but what you see on the street is just the tip of the spear. Most of the work is done in the background, where all kinds of support are welcome. Are you good with computers, but with people? Oh, there's always a lot to be done organizing the IT side of things. Not good with open conflicts, but good with ending them. Say hello to mediation teams and peacekeeping groups. Neither of the above, but you can cook or at least peel things. You have no idea how grateful everyone in the protest will be for a warm soup on a cold evening. And so the list goes on. So this is our solution to the climate crisis. Be loud or tinker with stuff. But most importantly, do it with others. So, care to give us a hand? Or at least, that's the one way to think this through. So, as promised, here's a little of our backstory. We run a philosophy slash social slash leftist channel in Poland, and the English one is a bit of an experiment for us. For now, we'll focus on translating some of our longer videos. Since this is a side project of our side project, we're aiming at about one video per month with about 30 to 40 minute runtime. Next up are the videos we quoted from, so a philosophical introduction to Anthropocene and another one on the Capitalocene. However, If you want to speed it up, join us at Patreon. It'll help us make more creative risks, not rely on the algorithm so much, and do more videos on the climate and philosophy, which we'd really, really love to. We feel that while there are some amazing climate channels dealing with political issues out there, like Andrewism, Climate Town, or Our Changing Climate, but the philosophical perspective still feels underrepresented. Oh, it would be a dream to do a long dissection on how Cartesian dualism sucks. How Spinozian monism is the only way. Like Hegel suggested, or something on Donna Haraway, Hutulusine, or on Rosie Brindotti, Zoe Centrism. <coughs> anyway, as a Patreon, you'll get access to our Discord, early access to videos, name and credits, and so on. Oh, and if you don't want or can't support us financially, It's fine, we love you just the same. Just please remember to do all the YouTube stuff, like thumbs up, comment, subscribe, and especially share. All of that's like essential for the new channel. Anyways, now that I've done the ad part, I'll add some more about our background. The channel is kinda big at 10,000 subs. That might not mean much, but even though the country is like 40 million, it's really, really right-wing leaning. And our politics is the second worst in the EU, after Hungary. So it's important for us to provide a balanced and leftist point of view. This makes a lot of our videos useless for this channel, because they've been better explained on English language YouTube. And you don't need two white cishet guys to teach you on cultural appropriation or transphobia. Alright, I said two guys. We are two friends, which is perhaps kind of unusual. Well, we are just two random guys from a small town who decided to make some videos during the pandemic, and it kinda stuck. I am the narrator, or Mr. N, or Pan N in Polish, and I'm the one doing voiceover and all the audio and video editing, while the other guy is the script writer. So Mr. S, or Pan S in Polish, he does the research and writing, has a philosophy master's and some kind of English certificate or whatever. I don't know, I'm forced to trust him on this one. Anyway. English is still challenging for us, especially for me, because it's been several years since I've actually had to use it. 
and so my accent and pronunciation are all over the place. But we've heard that the accents are solar punk. Thanks, Paweł. So whatever, I'm going with what I have. Also, there's this crap mentality in Poland, like the Polish people feel ashamed in front of the rest of the world. I mean, our government is definitely something to be ashamed of, but we feel that Polish leftists are especially ashamed of their country. I mean, even compared to other leftists, because any pride seems to be taken over by the right wing. But that's a long story. Oh, and recently Bat Empanada did an answer to Kurzgesagt, link in the description, but we haven't seen his video at the time of filming, we just didn't want to be influenced by it, especially because we didn't want to change much from the Polish version. Okay, that's it then. Thanks for sticking with us this long, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye bye! Right, not, right, scary. Right, right, not scary. Right. When in doubt, go Eastern European. Right. right. That's a classically evil part of the world. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. There you go. That'd work.